next on Unsolved Mysteries. An army pilot vanishes without a trace. His family believes he may have died while on a top secret mission for the CIA. Thieves tunnel into a bank vault in Hollywood and walk away with more than two million dollars. At a local park, a young woman is killed in a drive-by gang shooting. And police need your help to find her killer. When a retired couple is brutally gunned down in their own home, police turn to a psychic to help solve the case. Some hot cases, some cold cases, and some cases that will even shock you. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Valley, California. August 17th, 1958. 42 miles from the nearest town, a fish and game warden finds a car abandoned in the desert. The keys are still in the ignition. There is no sign of foul play. The car is registered to Lieutenant Paul Whipke of Fort Ord, California, almost 500 miles away. The Army reports that Whipkey has been missing for five weeks, and in fact, he's wanted as a deserter. But there's a problem. By all accounts, Paul Whipkey is the perfect soldier. No one who knows him believes that he could be a deserter. I don't think Paul deserted. It was completely out of character for Paul to do such a thing. He was a loyal American soldier devoted to his work. I think the Army knew exactly what happened to him. I think it was part of a big smokescreen cover-up. Paul Whipke was an ROTC honor graduate. After basic training, he won a spot in the Army Aviation School. In 1957, at Camp Desert Rock in Nevada, Paul flew an observation plane during the testing of the atomic bomb. He was exposed to radioactive fallout, and it wasn't long before unusual blotches appeared on his skin. Several months later, Paul, now stationed at Fort Ord, California, had to have all of his teeth removed. July 10th, 1958. Late in the afternoon, Paul left Fort Ord. He told friends that he was headed for the town of Monterey, less than a mile away. Paul never returned. The next morning, he was reported AWOL. 30 days later, he was declared a deserter. The following week, his car was discovered in Death Valley. The Army says that on the day Paul left, he apparently ended up at White's Motel in Mojave, California, some 350 miles from the base. Paul had signed the motel's guest register. Army investigators say they found a gasoline receipt in Paul's car. It showed that he had bought gas in Mojave. Paul's car then ended up in Death Valley, 145 miles away. On the very morning Paul turned up missing, two soldiers stripped his room at Fort Ord. Everything was removed, including Paul's personal belongings. Regulations state that the next of kin or legal representative must be notified before packing belongings, and they didn't notify us at that time. I was very suspicious of this action as soon as I discovered this had taken place. Carl Whipke's suspicions led him to investigate his brother's disappearance. The discrepancies he found only increased his doubts about the official Army story. Four weeks after Paul was reported AWOL, 
A witness driving through Death Valley saw his car. He said that it was driven by a man in a military uniform. However, when Paul left Fort Ord, he was wearing civilian clothes. When the car was found, a pile of cigarette butts was on the ground next to it, but Paul did not smoke. Also troubling to Paul's family was the fact that the Army waited nine months and only then began looking for his body. And it was only by accident that Carl Whipke heard anything about the car at all. The only way that I learned about it was due to an unofficial call to an enlisted man out at Fort Ord. In a half an hour, he called back very excited, and he said, this is classified information, and requested that I did not tell anyone where I had received this information. The investigation into Paul's disappearance also troubled his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Lewis. Yeah, I found it uh, almost unbelievable that uh, he would be classified as, as a deserter, and I was curious what was the basis for it. And I was quickly and promptly advised that, uh, Charlie, forget this. The case has been closed, and I would recommend that you don't carry it any further. And I, in essence, I was told to shut up and dry up and blow away. Charles Lewis and Paul Whitkey were both stationed in Nevada during 1957. Lewis recalls the day he saw two men in plain clothes talking to Paul. I noticed that they had gone directly to the airfield instead of reporting operations, which was required for a purpose of security. So I asked them for their identification. Excuse me, gentlemen, did you see that sign over there? Yes, sir. This is a restricted area. Do you have any identification? Yes, we do. They showed me their military identification cards, and the picture did verify who the two were. Looks OK. Is everything all right here? Yes, sir. Here we are. Over the next few weeks, Lewis often saw Paul talking to the same two men. When Lieutenant Whipke would come in after they had departed, you could feel and sense a rigidity in his personality traits and his mannerisms. Whipke, is everything OK? Everything's fine, sir. In hindsight, Lewis now believes that Paul may have met with the same two men for one simple reason. During that era, there was a tremendous amount of nationwide recruiting conducted by the CIA. And with Paul's qualification, Lieutenant Whitaker's qualification, he would have been an exceptional candidate for such a, an assignment. January of the year he disappeared, he told me during a telephone conversation that he was going to be going on an assignment that he was going to make a name for himself. Before he could tell me what it was, he was interrupted by some officers moving in the proximity of his desk, and he could no longer talk to me about the subject. I theorize that Paul was recruited into an Army CIA joint program that was going on at that time. I'm going into town. When Paul left Fort Ord, he drove to the town of Mojave, California, and checked into White's Motel. It's a possibility that he was met there by Army intelligence agents or the CIA and transported to Southeast Asia, possibly from Edwards Air Force Base, which is nearby. Lieutenant. Carl now believes that his brother was assigned to a secret mission and left his car with the Army. He thinks they kept it four weeks before driving it into the desert. I think the Army took his car out to the desert to get rid of it. Out of sight, out of mind. If they would just say, yes, he died on a secret assignment, we'd live with that. We're all loyal American citizens in our family, and we would buy that. Until the Army tell us what happened, there will be no peace in our family. In 1982, the Army reviewed Paul Whipke's case and found no basis to support his status as a deserter. Two months later, his final status was officially changed from deserter to died in the line of duty. 
His brother Carl hopes that someone watching might be able to shed some light on Paul's mysterious disappearance. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, thieves tunnel into a bank vault and walk away with $2 million. The perfect crime? Almost. Hollywood, California. Eight p.m. Friday night. The alarm goes off at First Interstate Bank. Police arrive to investigate, but find no evidence of a break-in. Hi, Gerald. Monday morning. Bank employees arrive for work. It's business as usual, until they open the vault. Two million dollars in cash, jewelry, and rare coins is gone. Safety deposit boxes opened like tin cans. A gaping hole in the floor leads to a tunnel that runs more than 30 yards to a storm drain. These guys were not your run-of-the-mill bank burglars. They were master criminals. My initial feelings that morning when we first arrived at the scene was one of, uh, of awe. I realized the fact that these suspects were excellent burglars. Uh, they would be extremely difficult to catch. Uh, they'd gone to a lot of work, and it was awesome. We view this burglary in the city as, as the crime of the century as far as burglaries go. Uh, the, the method of attack and the, the fact they got $2 million plus uh, their ingenuity. I had never seen a burglary like this in 27 years. It's worth this one about 100 yards up. The burglars used the storm drain running under LA city streets to access the bank. From the drain, they tunneled 95 feet to the vault a remarkable feat of precision engineering. The experts tell us that the type of tunnels they dug were very safe tunnels. The size of the tunnels, the shapes of the tunnels were extremely expertly done, and the contour of the tunnels were done as such to add extra strength and protection to those digging. Police searched storm drains within a three mile radius of the bank, looking for any signs of the burglars. When we concluded our investigation at First Interstate Bank, basically we were left with no clues at all. There was no physical evidence left. The suspects left us nothing to work with. And we were basically handcuffed. It appeared to be the perfect crime. And then, 14 months later, the tunneling bandits struck again. This time, they weren't so perfect. Saturday morning, another alarm goes off a Bank of America in West Los Angeles. When police arrive, a bank manager opens the vault. A gaping 18-inch hole perforates the steel-reinforced concrete floor. The burglars have long since disappeared. When I got the phone call from the officer at the bank, and he explained to me a hole in the floor, all I could think of was they're back, they've done it again, and how much money did they get this time? The thieves only got away with $90,000. Tools and work clothes were left behind, indicating that the burglars fled before they were done. Chisel. Also abandoned was this 18-inch drill bit, a diamond-tipped cutting tool used by construction crews to bore through solid concrete. This was purchased in the San Francisco Bay Area by a construction company using a fictitious name and address in San Diego, and they paid cash. So basically, we knew that it was probably a white male that purchased it, but no other information. There's a buildup of dirt on this side. Yeah. That's it. When police searched the storm drains within a few miles of the bank, they found something else. Yeah, nothing on the walls. 
a small all-terrain vehicle called a quad runner. Detectives believe that the tunnels were dug by just two men. They used the quad runners to move their heavy equipment underground. The drill alone weighed more than 100 pounds. We came to the conclusion that the suspects were very close friends, uh, possibly army buddies, uh, able to work together for long periods of time in very confined areas, taking up three to six weeks probably to dig that one tunnel. Police also believe that there must have been a third man working outside the bank as a scout. Time to move. Cops? I don't know. Gotta go. Police found two pairs of footprints in the tunnel, indicating that one burglar was barefoot, one in stocking feet. They abandoned one of the quads and apparently escaped on foot. But they left behind an important clue. The only fingerprint we developed was the on the uh, quad runner itself. We got one latent print from that vehicle. That print has been run through and compared with all arrestees. Uh, and it's our opinion that this individual has never been arrested. Look at this. Police continued searching for Look more evidence. That's hollow. About a mile and a half from the Bank of America, they found another tunnel completely finished. This one was 102 feet long and ended beneath a Beverly Hills bank. The mounting bolts for the drill were already in place under the vault. If they'd have been able to accomplish both burglaries that weekend, it's told to me by the people in the, in the banks, in the banking industry, that they probably would have gotten away with between 10 and uh, $20 million. Police learned the quad runner was purchased by a man using the name David Spaulding. His only known address, a post office box in Hollywood. Someone using this same name apparently bought five of the all-terrain vehicles. Because the tunnels were so well constructed, authorities believe the suspects had worked as miners or maybe in the building trades. So in order to stop others from digging their way to fortune, Police now patrol LA storm drains on a regular basis. Next, police in Houston need your help to find two gunmen who brutally shot and killed an innocent young woman. Houston, Texas. You know, everyone knows that you're going to die sometime in your life, but you expect to die when you're old, not when you're 19 years old. I think if Christy would have died from sickness or in a car wreck, it would just be a lot easier to accept than the fact that she was actually murdered because it was just senseless and there was no reason for it at all. Christy Martin was a college honor roll student and former high school cheerleader. On a Friday night, she and a friend named Wendy Wright we're hanging out with two brothers, Joe and Sal Barrera. Good question. Mm -hmm. I got you a good present, though. What'd they all knew each other from high school, and winter break from college was the perfect time to reconnect. Just 15 miles, but worlds away, members of a Houston street gang were cranking up their Friday night. Flaco. What's up, homes? What's up, Flaco? Come on over here, man. On the night of the uh, homicide, Jose Luis Rios, whose uh, gang name is Flaco, and Jorge Mendez were out that night, riding around drinking, looking for some kind of uh, problems to get into, looking to do something wild. Hey, look, where's the party at? I've dealt with Flaco before. He's told people in the past that it was the ultimate rush, the ultimate high to shoot somebody. Christy and her friends finished dinner and then drove to River Terrace Park, a popular hangout. When we were kids, we fished there, crabbed there, we picnicked there. Uh, you never had to worry about anybody bothering you for any reason. Uh, it was just a nice place to take your family. That might be why one of the reasons the kids went there, they felt safe there. Man, I'm cool. I'm looking inside. Wanna go inside? Oh, yeah. Well, Chris, do you wanna go for a walk? I'll go for a walk, yeah. 
But the park was no longer neutral territory. Flacco's gang liked to believe that it belonged to them. Oh, there is, sir. I don't know. Let's go check it out. You want to? Yeah. Let's go, man. Andale, andale, andale. Perate, sir. Perate, man. Hurry, let's go. I ain't going up for a while, yeah. We were just sitting there talking. When the truck drove up, I, I couldn't see it because my back was towards them. I thought it was just somebody else going to park next to us, you know, so they could, you know, do whatever they wanted to do. Come here. Oh, great, who are these guys? Hey, I'm almost stuck up with you. We probably need to go, okay? No, look, just ignore them. Can we I mean, just probably go? Drunk. Come on. Let's Come on. go. Whatever. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. as fast as I could to the front of my car. By the time I got to the front, they took off. I just see Christine, you know, on the floor, just, you know, laying there. I just ran, ran over there towards her, and I was talking to her, yelling, please don't go, don't leave us. Oh, God, Chris, Christy! She's just there. And breathing slowly and just staring at you. You knew she was already gonna die. I mean, she had the glare in her eye, like she was trying to look at you, but looking past you, you know? Wendy Wright and the Barrera brothers escaped without serious injury. But Christy Martin took a direct hit from the assault rifle and died at the scene. When Christy didn't come home, my concern was maybe she had a car accident. I never dreamed in a million years it would be something such as a drive-by shooting because I guess I just assumed that only happened to other people, that it didn't happen to somebody that was a good person and that wasn't involved in gangs, in, you know, any way at all. Within six days, the shooter, Jose Rios, alias Flacco, and the driver, Jorge Mendez, were formally charged with Christy's murder. They both had long records of gang-related crimes. Four weeks before the attack, Mendez had legally purchased the assault rifle used by Flacco in the killing. It's hard to swallow that, that these kids are able to get out there and buy assault-type weapons and then to come back and just fire them at will at anybody they want. What type of gun that this man bought, I don't even call him a man, this animal bought, is sold to kill people. He bragged to some of his gang members that he was going to kill somebody with it. He bought this gun to kill somebody with. It so happened it was our daughter. Jose Rios has been linked to a second killing. An uncle of Jorge Mendez was gunned down at an intersection, and Rios is a suspect. The uncle had told Jorge, along with uh, Flacco, uh, that if they didn't turn themselves in, that he would call the police on them himself. Uh, and within two days of that uh, reported meeting between them, uh, he ends up being shot. The information we're picking up off the street is that Jose Luis Rios Flacco is also taking credit uh, for that homicide. While Rios and Mendez run free, Brian and Judy Martin dread every Christmas. It's the anniversary of their daughter's funeral. Christmas will be really hard from now on. It just will never be the same. So it, it's really a sad time. And I know Christmas should be a happy time, but I, I can't imagine it being any sadder than Christmas Eve will be this year without Christy. Losing your mother or a brother, I mean, that's rough. I've lost them both. My dad, both my parents have died, my brother has died. All I have left is my family, my immediate family. And uh, when you lose a child, it takes a big hunk out of your heart. Update. Jorge Mendez fled to Mexico, where he was arrested on unrelated charges some five years later. American authorities have requested that he be brought back to stand trial for the murder of Christy Martin. Jose Rios remains at large. 
Rios is 5 feet 7 and weighs 140 pounds. He has numerous tattoos, including a skull and dagger on his right forearm, two teardrops below his left eye, and on his neck, the cartoon character Casper, the friendly ghost. Next, police turn to a psychic to help them solve a brutal double homicide. We are in the LAPD evidence warehouse. An actual murder investigation is in progress. But you won't find this procedure in any textbook. Relax, breathe. Take a breath. He hurt me. In the argument, he hurt you? <laughs> Earlier. Noreen Rainier is a psychic from Orlando, Florida, who works with the police. Use his hand. Yes, his fist. Among the psychics that we have profiled, she is unique, a true unsolved mystery. This is earlier. Noreen Rainier has worked with the police on nearly 400 different crimes. In one of her most remarkable cases, she provided crucial information that helped solve the double homicide of Jake and Dora Cohn. Colony, New York, a suburb of Albany. I'm glad to hear that. Dora Cohn is chatting with her daughter, who we'll call Judy. In an instant, tragedy strikes. Yeah, well, anytime's fine. How about... Jake! Mom? Jake! Dora screams out her husband's name twice. Mom, have you dropped the phone? Julie immediately calls 911. And then Julie calls her son, James Mariani, and rushes to meet him at her parents' home. They're not telling me anything and they're not letting me in. Mom! Ma'am, ma I'm sorry. What's going on in there? I'm What's sorry. Going What's going on? on? My parents are in there. Ma'am, listen Something's to me. Wrong. Listen to me. I hate to tell you this, but they've been killed. <gasps> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. The elderly female was lying on the floor with the phone still in her hand. It appeared that she had fallen over while on the telephone. Uh, the male victim was on the floor in a hallway. He appeared to be shot in the nose. The only evidence that we found was the entranceway door had been kicked in. Part of the, the door stopper was laying on the kitchen floor, and it was two empty shells uh, also laying on the floor. When James Mariani knew at a glance that the shells were 25 caliber, he instantly became a suspect in his grandparents' murder. The, the police asked him to take a lie detector test, even though they yes. knew that he had been at his house when the murders occurred. Did you shoot Jake and Dora? No. The results were inconclusive, but police remained suspicious. Mariani had a criminal record, and he had friends with criminal records. Friends, Larry, police Larry, interviewed Jason. two men that Mariani had done jail time with. Keith Snare and Robert Skinner. Both had alibis. No, this is my girlfriend. What's, what's her name? Sandy. Two years went by with no leads. And then Jake and Dora's daughter heard about Noreen Rainier and asked police to contact her. Noreen, I sent you some articles that were present at the crime Noreen scene. worked the case long distance by phone. She knew nothing except the names and ages of the victims. I'm going to start with the glasses. I'm going to start with Dora. I'm going to try to tune in and see what she saw just before she was killed. Well, the Jeep doesn't have to bowl that night. We'd love to come. When she was Dora, uh, she described how she was on a telephone with a female. Uh, she hears a crashing sound. It's a recipe. Oh, Jake. Jake! Oh, shooting me. I'm being shot. Noreen called out Jake's name twice, just as Dora had done before she was shot. Now, as she's Jake, she describes how she gets up off the couch. Jake! 
goes down a narrow hallway, and she's confronted with someone with a gun. I know you. What the hell are you doing here? Noreen remembers that she felt pain in the center of her face, exactly where Jake had been shot. She had given a pretty accurate description of both Jake and Dora, and a fairly accurate description of the crime scene. Uh, this made me take notice and, and, and feel that she was credible in what she was doing. I'm gonna count from five to zero. As I count, your eyes will become heavier and heavier. And the police started to feel that Noreen might be able to help them crack the case. They asked her to work with a hypnotist. One and zero. Now going back. Dora, tell me about the intruder. We knew him. He was a younger man. What are you doing? Brown hair. And he came Jesus. to our house Jesus. for dinner. He did some work for my husband. I know you. What are you doing in here? I'm not playing, old man. Where's the money? What do you want? Where's the money? What are you talking about? Where is the money? I want you to tell me his name. Focus, perhaps we'll take a letter at a time. Do you see a letter? Yes. You see another letter. Following the hypnosis session, we presented Noreen with a series of 10 photographs. We had put uh, three of them in there who we felt were the suspects at this time. So I'd like oh, no, to show I, you I, the... I don't want to see them. Why don't you just lay them face down and let me pick up the energies from them? OK. Noreen took the photographs. As a matter of fact, her eyes were closed. and. Uh, and just shuffled through the photographs, held them for a while, held each one, and then kept placing one, two, three photographs down. I feel the strongest energy from these three photographs. And this one in particular, he might have been the one that killed Jake and Dora. The man in the first photo had nothing to do with this case. But the second photo was Robert Skinner, a friend of Jake and Dora's grandson, James Mariani. The third photo was Mariani himself. The police also noted that Robert Skinner's last name began with an S, the one letter Noreen had visualized. This is my girlfriend. What's, what's her name? Sandy. When police double-checked Robert Skinner's alibi, it fell apart. In the end, James Mariani, Robert Skinner, and Keith Snare were charged and convicted for the murders of Jake and Dora Cohn. Mariani will not be eligible for parole until 2029. Snare will serve time until at least 2031, and Skinner will likely die in prison, serving 87 years to life. 15. So what psychic power did Noreen draw upon to help solve this case? When the skeptics ask me, how does it work? My answer usually is, you've been using your logical, rational mind for many years. Explain to me how it works. How does your memory, how do you learn math? How does a brain work when you spell? You don't know, and neither do I, but you can use your mind, and so can I. Next, a man needs your help to find the truth about his father's mysterious past. For any child, the death of a parent is traumatic. For a boy named Bob Coleman, it became a time to reflect on everything he had ever known about his father, or at least everything his father had wanted him to know. Washington, D.C. Everyone said Richard Coleman was an ordinary man who lived a fairly uneventful life. 
He worked as a vending machine mechanic. He had served in the military and married in 1947. His son Bob was born two years later. Today, Bob's strongest memory of childhood is the love of baseball that he shared with his father. He had a passion to play ball, and um, we'd go out to the yard, the side yard and the front yard, and he'd pitch the ball to me, and I'd hit it, and it was something that I enjoyed an awful lot. And I loved being outside with him and um, playing ball whenever we could. Richard died in 1961. A short time later, Bob stumbled on the first hint that his father had been a man with many secrets. Bob was drawn to an old trunk that belonged to his father. Inside, he found a collection of souvenirs from his father's military service. What are you doing, Bobby? Just looking at Dad's old stuff. Was Dad in the Army? Yes, he was, but... I remember uh, many, many times asking my mom about my dad and specifically honing in on the items in the footlocker, and she didn't have too many explanations other than that she believed that my dad had done something he wasn't real proud of and that his words were, it's over and done with. Fourteen years later, Bob's own military service drew him back to his father's trunk. Once again, he held his father's uniform. It had the uh, silver bars of a first lieutenant still on it. It had the uh, insignia, interestingly enough, of a uh, medical corps, a uh, plain caduceus, which would indicate that the person who wore that uniform was a uh, medical doctor in the Army. Was it possible that Richard Coleman, the vending machine mechanic, had been a doctor in the Army? For Bob, it was a possibility that triggered a vivid childhood memory. Ow! Oh! Oh my God! I'm bleeding! Richard! Richard! Oh! My mom Richard. had cut her hand open very, very badly, and there was a lot of blood. She was bleeding profusely. Bobby, Sharon, come in here, please. <laughs> and I remember my dad taking control of the situation, sizing up the, um, the emergency. Oh, everything will be OK. Yeah. Don't worry. He applied the pressure to the to the cut and actually knew about pressure points and, and did something that I don't remember because I was small, but he did something that he actually was able to stop the bleeding pretty quickly. And he took control of the situation in a way that would lead me to believe that he knew more about um, the medical field than somebody who was not trained. Atta boy. See, everything is fine. Why would See, Richard Coleman stuff. abandon his career in medicine? For Bob, it meant that his father was not the man that he thought he knew. His father's trunk provided Bob with other clues that raised even more questions. Although his father's uniform was from World War II, Bob found several medals from World War I. Discharge papers from World War I raised still more questions. It was a World War I certificate. And as I looked at it, I remember uh, noticing that items had been written over. Someone had gone back after it was issued and put my father's name, Richard Coleman, and, his, and a service number, and other information were written over the original inscriptions. It appeared that the document had been forged. When Bob checked with the VA, his suspicions were confirmed. The discharge papers had been issued to another soldier. Finally, Bob found no record of a Richard Coleman ever serving in the Army Medical Corps in either World War. Room right there. These strange revelations about his father brought back another painful memory. Has anybody came to visit you? No, you're the first one. What about your brothers and sisters and your family? Shh. We're daddy's family, honey. I remember asking several times, well, my dad's sick. He's probably going to pass away. Where's his family? And why hasn't anyone appeared to see how he is or, you know, to visit him? What a beautiful dress you have. And my mom really wouldn't answer it. She didn't have an answer, I guess. And I never, I never got any uh, satisfactory explanation for that. 
The trunk held one final clue, the membership roster from a New York City gun club. Richard Coleman was listed as a member in 1944. When Bob researched his father's address, he uncovered another surprising detail. My father may have lived with an Alice Coleman, and I don't know what her um, maiden name was, but voting records indicate that they were married and that she was a housewife and that she lived with Richard Coleman. I've never been able to uh, confirm their marriage because there's no record that I can find. And indeed, I don't know where Alice Coleman um, went to because after 1967, she does not appear in the, Met in the uh, Manhattan phone books. Did Richard Coleman change his identity to hide something in his past? Why did he keep his apparent marriage to Alice Coleman secret? And despite a trunk full of war mementos, why did the military show no record of his service in either world war? Bob Coleman remains determined to find the answers. I'm not trying to judge my father. I'm trying to learn about him, and I'm perfectly um, aware that there may be something that he did 50, 60 years ago that was um, pretty bad, perhaps, and it would have uh, prompted him to change his identity and to obscure his past. But it's also something that's very important to me because it's my father, and it may be the only way that I uh, ultimately end up really knowing who he was and what he did, and I'm very passionate and very committed to doing that. Update. Bob Coleman has found the real identity of his father, Coleman Joel DeCourt. Bob discovered that his father had been previously married but abandoned his family. Armed with his dad's real name and real birth date, Bob and his sister were welcomed by a newfound family.